All right, tonight let's take our Bibles and turn to the 10th chapter of the book of the Revelation. Can't uh, catch up and go on with some of the things that we have been studying with reference to the family. You know, as we've stated before, we would love very, very much to see an emphasis by way of family unit. Because with the breakdown of the family unit, you have the breakdown of the home. And we've used uh, Joshua 24, 15 as the motto, as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. There's quite a lot with reference to responsibilities of individuals as far as husbands, as far as wives, as far as children are concerned. And there isn't a great deal by way of biblical revelation concerning the family unit. However, <clears throat> there are a number of passages which relate to the house or to the household. And... Uh, it is in this connection that we have been endeavoring to study as far as the unit is concerned. And just by way of a brief review, since it's been a month or such a matter since we first, uh, our last taught on this, you remember we had the matter of Joshua's choice, and then he presented a cost and a commitment. And then we observed, as far as our outline is concerned, what the Bible had to say concerning the blessed home. A certain illustrations such as Onesiphorus mentioned twice in Scripture, this man mentioned twice in Scripture, and each mention of this man in the Word of God was in direct relation to his family, to his house. It must have been a tremendous testimony that this man had, because whenever God saw fit to record his name in Revelation, he included his house. And then you remember the Philippian jailer, how that he and his household were saved. The Apostle Paul and Silas, they, they, st they stayed with him and rejoiced in things of the Lord. And then there's a mention in 1 Corinthians concerning Stephanus. The household of Stephanus was saved and was baptized. And we left off last time with the function of what the Bible has to say by way of the function of the family unit. And one of the major things that we observed was faithfulness. Faithfulness, and this involves character and conduct. And is that which is reliable, that which is trustworthy, and this is one of the characteristics. And then also the orderliness of the home. And this is exactly where we left off. You remember I gave you uh, just a little bit of a <clears throat> a thought to um, think about with reference to the orderliness of the function of the home. First of all, with reference to the rule of the home. And wherever the man is mentioned in this connection, we have the Greek word prohistomy. Prohistomy. It is not the word kurios, which is Lord. No, none whatsoever. Now, in the Bible, when you're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ as the head of the church, the head of the church, he's spoken of as kurios, kurios. And that relates to the order of the exalted position of Christ over the body, the church. He's the head. Now, that is not the word that's used for the man of the home. The word for the man of the home is prosthistomy prohistomy, and it means to stand before, to preside, to set over, and it's translated rule. Now, as we mentioned for you in 1 Timothy, and I think that we will just turn there once again, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3, where we observe something with reference to this matter. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 4, and verse 5, and in verse 12. <coughs> and then we'll notice 1 Timothy 5 also. Now, in 1 Timothy 3, 4, speaking with reference to the bishop, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. Now, the word here means one that presides well over his home. One that stands, one that is set over, 
one that gives direction with care and diligence. Notice verse 5. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Verse 12. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife. Again, ruling their children and their own houses well. The same word, presiding over, caring, tenderly directing, and giving direction and care. Now, in the fifth chapter, possibly we have one of the best uh, biblical commentaries concerning the function of the head of the family unit. <clears throat> These things, verse 7 and 8, These things give in charge that they may be blameless. But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, his own house, he has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. So looking at the family unit, God has the matter well in hand and in an orderly fashion. I'm sorry that uh, something has gotten across in this day and age in which we live with reference to the position of the man in the home. Why it has been construed this way, I do not know. But I have been in uh, relationships with various ones, and I've noticed something, especially in our younger group of people, married groups, that a man, the husband, in order to manifest headship, seems to be manifesting dictatorship. Now that is far, far from the truth. I recall one young married couple particularly. They are not with us, but uh, used to be here. And uh, they have no children. And uh, I remember the mother-in-law stating to me this. Well, he believes in ruling the home. And I watched those two kids. I watched them. And this is what I discovered in putting it very colloquially, something like this. It would be this. When he would come home, the attitude was, jump. And she'd say, how high, honey? That was the attitude and the feeling that you get in that relationship. And it was under the guise, the biblical guise, of being the head of that home. That is just as wrong as wrong can be. It's totally wrong. You don't find the Lord in Ephesians 5 in that regard at all. As Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, so the husband is to love the wife. Now, it isn't hard to be orderly arranged under that kind of love, is it? Where you have the sacrifice and where you have the total giving. And perhaps some of you will remember the prayer meeting that I gave about a year ago where in order for a person, man, to rule, he must first be in submission in the sense of love. See? And submission is that which is well-ordered, arranged in proper order. The husband is not spoken of as the curious. Now, I know what First Peter has to, uh, First Peter 3 has to say where Sarah called Abraham Lord and all of this. I know that. But the thought is not, not dictatorship at all. None whatsoever. If you find love as being that which is dictatorial, fine and dandy. But not just because there's a man. Absolutely not. It's prohistomy. Prohistomy. 
to stand to preside, to provide and to care and to protect. And the uh, last illustration I gave you with reference to this matter was that which I believe is very, very accurate. You see, in order to rule, as we have here, it is a rule to preside, take the proper place. It is a rule of consideration, and it's a ru rule of provision, and a rule of care, and it's a rule of love. That's the head of the home. And um, uh, it is to shore up to establish whereby there is to be that provision. And incidentally, in that first Peter 3, we are told that this must be the case or else the prayer life is hindered. See? Now, the illustration of when I went to the mountains, I borrowed this pony, and my mother phoned ahead to my older brother, said, Now, Charlie Albert should get through the canyon at about a certain time, and it'll take him about another hour after he gets on top to get to the river. And you be sure and meet him at the river, because the water was high, and uh, we were having the drain off and the runoff, and of course in the mountains, your rivers don't flow uh, s slow like the Gooley here. It's the, just like this. And <clears throat> sure enough, when I got there, there was Charlie over on the other side of what we call the West Muddy Creek. It was quite a torrent. And um, I was riding a pony, and he had a large, large, uh, uh, large horse. And uh, he said, now you, you stay right there. And so he forded uh, the river, and the water would hit the saddle skirts. <clears throat> and uh, uh, yet with all of that, uh, his horse floundered a bit. And so he got across, and he said, Now, you get upstream from me, and I'll get below you here. And so he said, Now, you stay right with me. So we started across, and just as soon as we got into the current, of course, the strong uh, water uh, just took my pony and put it right against his. And so his horse with what help my pony could give, he just took me right across the river. Or I had tumbled on into the current. Now that is what the word prohistomy means by illustration. To rule means to stand before, to guide in the sense of provision, in the sense of care, not dictatorial, absolutely not. Let it be understood once and for all that when the man walks into the home, he's the head of the home. Why, then you don't have the holy hush. He's here. Everyone sit. Don't open your mouth until he says, get up. Have you been in situations like that? I have. You bet your life I have. And uh, that is, <laughs> I think some of you have been in situations like that too. Now that's wrong. And I'll tell you, it is, it is that which is also taught in many cases with reference to the Christian home. Now that's not right, folks. That's not right. Forever let that be uh, blasted from one's thinking. Man is to take the place to preside. The family unit to function as a unit must have one to preside. And that's what the word rule process to me means, to stand before, to preside, and to care. Indicates care and diligence. And then you remember I mentioned to you about the function of the orderly home concerning the woman. 
And we left off, and all right, all of you, look at 1 Timothy 5, 14. 1 Timothy 5, 14. And this is where I left you last time, you remember? I cut a despoteo. I cut a despoteo. Occurs only once in the New Testament, the Pauline epistles, concerning the function of the family unit. We're talking about the family, the family unit. And oikos is house, despote. Well, you know what a despot is, don't you? A despot is an absolute ruler. It's translated in our New Testament concerning the Lord as the despote, translated as Lord. A despot is one that has no equal or superior. Now this is rather strange. And sometime when I run up against one of these fellows that uh, wants to uh, make the lordship of the husband as uh, they do, I'm just going to give them this one Greek word and tell them to look it up. The one place it occurs in the Pauline epistles, it refers to a woman, a woman. You'll find it used in the Gospels with reference to a householder. For instance, in John chapter 2, where you have the Lord Jesus Christ at the marriage of the Cana of Galilee, <coughs> the master of the house came to him at the end of their marriage feast and, you remember, spoke to him. Well, most people bring out uh, the best wine first and after they're well drunk, then they bring out that which is uh, not so good. But here you have left that which is best for the last. Here's the householder. Here is the one that is in charge, if you please, of the house. And we take it, it uh, relates, relates to the marriage within his house. Now, this word is used with reference to him there. And throughout the Gospels, it's a householder. But now look, I want to um, go back to verse um, uh, verse 9. Let n uh, This is First Timothy 5. Let not a widow be taken into the number under three score years and old, having been the wife of one man well reported of for good works. If she have brought up children, if she had lodged strangers, if she washed the saints' feet, if she have relieved the afflicted, if, they have, if she has diligently followed every good work. But the younger widows refuse. <coughs> for when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry, having damnation, because they have cast off their first faith. And with all they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also, and busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. Verse 14, now notice carefully. I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house. Oi kata despoteo. Give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. For some are already turned aside after Satan. Now here, remember ladies, we left you with this house despot. You're the house despot. But it doesn't mean to get the rolling pin out. No, it doesn't mean that at all. Even though that word is oi kata despoteo, the house despot. Now I ask you to give a little thought about this. Now this has been over a month. I don't know whether you've thought about it or not. But uh, uh, let's, let's have a little fun this morning, shall we? Let's make it very informal. All right, who wants to come up with a, a, just a little bit of a question or a suggestion as to what this means with reference to the woman of the house? What does it mean? 
What does it mean? What does it mean? Very informal. We'll just, we just, we we'll just have a little, little fun this morning. What does it mean? <laughs> Come on, Dick. You're just about ready to say something. <laughs> All right, all right, that she's to be the head of the house when the husband is not there, keep everything in order. All right, uh, something else. <laughs> I don't want to stay right in there, Nick. Bless your heart. All right, what else? Anyone else? It says young women. Yes. You see, actually the chapter is dealing with the care of widows and who are qualified as widows. And a widow who qualifies for help is one that is uh, 60 years old and having been the wife of one man. See, that constitutes a widow that's qualified for help within the circle of the ministry. Outside of that, uh, also other places here, we're told that uh, uh, widows should be cared for by their families. See. And if they're not cared for by their families, then uh, there is a responsibility encumbered upon the group of believers that they care for this lady uh, if she is 60 years of age and uh, has been the wife of one man. Now, it doesn't mean one man at a time. It means one man, period. And uh, that's... Uh, I know there's quite an argument along those lines, but that's, that's nevertheless what it says. And the younger ones, uh, but the younger widows refuse. And we're just told that uh, they, we are, we're, not to, we're not to care for uh, the younger ladies as far as the church family is concerned because with reference to this, there seems to be the implication uh, right here that uh, uh, from the scriptural point of view says for when they begun to wax wanton against Christ they will marry and there seems to be uh, some implication there that uh, this is uh, a conduct that is not in keeping with the uh, holy living for a widow see but uh, uh, back to our verse 14, I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, be the house despot, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. Yes. Let me just throw something out to you. When one of the little ones gets sick, who do they call for? That's right. Mommy. Mommy. Isn't that right? Invariably, it's mommy. That's true. Now, that's no reflection on you men at all. But, <laughs> you know, I have more fun watching these young couples. <laughs> you know, when little ones come into their home, man, the change. And the education. 
<laughs> that just goes on. And I just sit back and I just chuckle to myself. And I, yeah, they were going to do this and they were going to do that. And oh, man, I'm like, boy, they, do they ever eat a plate full of words. <laughs> yes, <laughs> they, they sure do. <laughs> Haven't we all? All right, uh, this this isn't bad. Let let's have a little more discussion here with the the Oikos Despoté. Yes, in Proverbs chapter 31, you have quite a model passage with reference to a woman. Isn't that right? <coughs> I just want to throw out a word of caution for you. If you're going to use Proverbs and if you're going to use the Old Testament, make sure that you understand that you're on Jewish ground, eh? Just make sure you are. Because if you're going to use that passage in that way, then don't, don't divorce your other passages which relate to Jewish thought either, such as Psalm 127, where you have the matter of, happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them, for the large families are those that constitutes a man in the place of the upper bracket of Jewish society, and he's considered to be one of the elders if he has a great large family. Just be careful. Principles, true. But explicit application, watch it. Now most of you who have been here at Northland Bible College are quite aware of the principle of interpretation that we follow, and that is the literal interpretation of Scripture, realizing that the Old Testament is that which points us towards Him. When you come to the day of Pentecost, you have the church, and then you have a whole new economy of God. Isn't that right? If this is not the case, we've got some real problems on our hands with reference to marital relations. Did Abraham have more than one wife at a time? He sure did. Did Solomon have any problem along these lines? One of the wisest men on the face of the earth, but he'd sure be a dummy today. Isn't that right? How many concubines did that fellow have at the same time? He had more than a harem, isn't that right? Certainly. Solomon was not upbraided because of his harem in the Old Testament. But Solomon was upbraided because of his refusal to walk according to the commandments of God. Right? Now, did David have any problem with reference to more than one wife? You better believe he did. You be careful. Be very, very careful of taking the explicit circumstances of the Old Testament and try to put them down as standards for the church because the word, well, we're right here in front of us. We, got, we have a specific thing, don't we, with reference to a widow? We certainly do. That in itself is adequate for us to see that there's certainly a change in the economy of God with man. It certainly is. So even though we have this as far as fine principles there, and we should should observe that, I think it is quite good to use it as a commentary in light of verse 14. Isn't that right? Very, very good as far as some principles there in Proverbs 13. But let's <coughs> let's have a little more fun here with this oikata despotes. Very good, very good. Yes, ma'am. A 
But you see this word, guide the house, as that one word, oikara despote. That's what it means. Guide the house. Now, stay right there. You're, you're doing okay. That's all right. Okay. Yes, sit. Yes, there's a strict contrast, isn't there, between verse 13 and 14, which adds and throws light upon the validity of verse 14. Now, there's just a number of things that we can put together here just right within the context itself, just a lot of things, a lot of things. S certainly, first of all, we observe what the woman is not to be. That's verse 13, isn't that right? As well as the contrast there in, say, verse 11 and 12. 11, 12, and 13. Certainly, we know that that is not to be characteristic. But the younger widows refuse. All right, we certainly know that as far as responsibility of the ministry of God is concerned, that younger ones are in a place of danger. For when they begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry. Strange. Having judgment, damnation, because what? They've cast off their first faith. Strange again, isn't it? Amazing. That's what the Scriptures say. And with all, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also and busybodies, speaking things which they ought not to. But now notice a contrast. I will, therefore, that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, Give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully, for some are already turned aside after Satan. Now, <clears throat> in this matter of the function of the unit, the man must be in the place to preside, to provide, and to care, and to show that sacrificial love that's to be characteristic for the family unit. Now then, for the unit, the man may be the head, but I'll guarantee you, the woman is the heart. She's the heart. And if you want a pulse, and if you want to feel the pulse, of the family unit, feel the pulse of the woman. And when I read about Onesiphorus, spoke, speaking with reference to his house, I don't have a word concerning his wife. But when I come to this portion of the scripture, all I can, all I can do is deduct what a wife he must have had. What a wife he must have had. For a man to be acclaimed because of his house. His house. Folks, I, my heart just is rent from stem to stern over the present day society of the degrading of womanhood. Everything in society cheapens the woman. And boy, if you can kill the heart, 
What good's ahead, huh? What good's ahead? And society is teaching our young women to look like tramps. And to act like it, too. I watch very carefully where I go to minister. And do you know what I watch? I watch the appearance and conduct of women. And there was a sweet little young lady out at camp. And she came to me and I had occasion to commend her. And I said, I want to say something to you. You and John are a wonderful couple. And I want to commend you on your appearance here at camp this week. How she dressed, how she conducted herself. Um, Oh, ladies, God calls you that price greater than gems and rubies if you have the proper conduct. Did you know that? You didn't talk about men like that at all. You are a special trophy of God's marvelous creation. Let's exalt our women. Keep our women in the place of the highest of integrity. Don't bring them down. Don't bring womanhood down because when you bring women down, you lose a society and you lose a home. You women have such a special, such a special place. In the heart of God, man might have been created first, but he looked at man and he said, my, what a pitiful thing you are. I've got to do something about this. I gotta have something to help you out. Isn't that right? So he gave him, put him to sleep, and said, We'll take a rib. There have been lots of fun made of that. But I'm still thankful to my dear mother for that which she instilled in my mind with reference to women. I can hardly stand to see a woman degraded. One of my first trips to the north before we ever thought of moving up here, I came through Spanish down there. And there was a big tavern there. And here was a woman. She looked at first blush like a fine looking lady. But then I saw her. Come right on in, folks, and sit down right down. We're just about to wind up. And <clears throat> there she was, staggering, defiled with defecation all over her. I almost vomited to see a woman in that condition. I hurt all that day because I saw a woman. Women, I don't know how I can emphasize it more. You are special. And in all of the Pauline epistles, he doesn't refer to a man 
with such a strong word as this. He uses a woman. Boycott a despotate. Now, we want to be careful. What we teach with reference to our women. Now, I know I've done more preaching than teaching this morning. <laughs> but I'm going to finish this, Lord willing, next Sunday morning. But would you just spend this week in this context for a while? Will you do that, please? And uh, just see what you might be able to dig and uh, to see what God uh, has to say concerning uh, this all-important function of the family unit of which the woman the woman holds such an exalted, exalted position. I, uh, I'm not in favor of this teaching that uh, exalts the man and uh, subjects the woman. No, sir. It's not scriptural. When man and woman in the family unit can function scripturally, then you're going to have a home. But you have a man that is the despot, and the woman the slave servant and I'll show you a home that's out of balance no sir you've got to have the man you've got to have the woman in that proper proper relationship so the unit the unit is right is right our father how we thank you for your word be pleased O God to minister to our hearts direct us in light of the teaching in light of the learning from the word and help us O our father to be in submission to the truth of the book. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.